but I've seen local side effects. Um, I haven't seen any major dystonic side effects or um, other syndromic side effects, such as uh, serotonin syndrome, anything like that. Yep. Uh, so I haven't seen any major side effects of that. I have seen some of those side effects, you know, thirst, thing, things like that, when when they become unsedated. Uh, but neither have I actually to date, just trying to think, I don't think I've actually ever had to bag any of those patients. Yeah. Um, so I've seen deep sedation, but not sedation that impedes um, breathing. Um, and I'm happy for them to remain deeply sedated just to sleep on their side. Yep. They're in a hospital, they're being observed. So, yeah, deeper sedation is the biggest side effect. In the, when you were previously using benzodiazepines, did you see a reasonable amount of apnea or respiratory depression in that group when you were using benzos for sedation or still not that significant? Not not frequent, but, yes, we certainly saw it. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes you'd have to bag the patient for a minute or two. Well, we did bag the patient for a minute or two. When he actually had to, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Do it, they might well have been fine as well. Um, so, yes, yeah, I think that side effects were more frequent, but from my mind, they were pretty my, minor side effects. Yep. The biggest issue was a wall off fast. <sighs> Okay. How long did you generally see, in, in your experience, the um, the parenteral benzodiazepines would last? Um, and it varied from patient to patient. Some of them you would give it and they would wake up in half an hour and they would be fine. Yep. Um, and whatever crisis they were going through has been averted and they feel better now. Others you would give it, and 10 minutes later, they were starting to become agitated again. Yeah, okay. Um, and so on. So, yeah, somewhere between the 10 and 30 minutes, I think, was the duration of effect. Um, but the, those that it was longer tended not to become so agitated. Okay, yeah. yep. And have you seen any, I guess, early um, waking up with a lanzapine, or generally they're sedated for a more prolonged period of time than, say, 10, 15 minutes on average? No, I think they're less sedated mm-hmm. with the lanzapine than they were. So early waking, many of them won't be completely sedated. Yep. Um, they'll be growly, but now easily rousable, even able to talk to you, yep. but just not as agitated. Yep. Some of them will still be a little bit agitated, but that just sort of reduces over time. Those that are more deeply sedated, yes, it certainly lasts longer. You know, so, as I said, sometimes it lasts all night. Um, but yes, yeah, so look, some of those patients, you wake up, they're a bit agitated or are still agitated, so they get multiple doses or need multiple doses before they stop being agitated. Um, the, there is no dose that treats everyone and I think you know even even in my practice of using relatively big doses I've had to give four or five or six doses or two doses of one drug and two or three doses of another drug yep. two sedate patients so yes I ring the psychiatrist and say this patient's had 80 milligrams of alanzapine and uh, 80 milligrams of uh, medagalam and uh, how much risperidone do you want me to give them they sort of say, what's the patient like? And you hear the patient screaming still in the background. Um, yeah, they're, they're difficult patients. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. <laughs> um, okay, beautiful. Thank you. That Just because you've had such, I guess, a, a long term of experience with different drugs, it's just useful to hear your personal experience. So that's very helpful. Thanks, Ed. Um, I think unless there's anything else that you wanted to add about the drugs or pharmacology kind of side of things, that's probably all the questions that I had for you on um, the medication side of things. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? No, other than you know, the, the planned outcome or the, that all of this is leading to, we may get some evidence to help us decide on one drug and two dosage or the effect of different doses is needed. Yes. Um, to, to guide what we do. It would be nice if we all did roughly the same thing or we all acted within certain parameters. That would be very helpful. Yep. 
I think, well, hopefully the RCT will be useful. I think it's looking like this is not related to the interview, but um, we, we're trying, obviously, part of the reason we've done that survey is to try and get some sort of consensus about which IM drugs we should use. Um, yeah. And I think we thought it would be helpful to compare, obviously, a benzo and a, an antipsychotic of some sort and ketamine. Obviously, ketamine's not used that commonly in Victoria in the inpatient kind of setting, but obviously it is in ambulance, and I think a lot in, in Queensland as well. Um, I think it's looking like probably it's going to be draperidol, like uh, just from, I guess, community of practice in terms of who's using what. Um, but hopefully that will give us some answers, maybe. It's, the dosing side of things is tricky, um, I guess, in terms of we probably are not going to have a clear clear information about, uh, say, a dose per kilo of say 0.1 per kilo versus 0.2 versus 0.3 for each drug is the only thing but yeah but the, the number of doses that patients need yes and so on of which drug over what time frame to achieve an agreed end point and that's also the hard bit mm. the end point so when should i or should i not give more of this medication um that, that, that will still be very useful because if we say actually if you use this dose, on average people needed three doses over four hours to become sedated. You say, well, that, that will tell me that we needed to use a bit more up front. Yeah. Yeah, that is very true. We will get that information. Um, but yes, hopefully we'll have some answers, but probably, you know, we're looking um, towards the end of the decade, mid, mid to sure. end of... <laughs> Um, beautiful. So uh, apart from that, Ed, I guess just in terms of paediatric behavioural disturbance in general, um, is there anything else that you wanted to add or things that you feel hasn't been covered in this interview that you think it would be useful um, from your experience to be either further investigated or things that you'd like us to know as a research team? sense i know the kids it sounds like from what i was when i was speaking to claire maybe is going to turn the the bar room into a sensory modulation room um i don't know how far along that is but i haven't spoken to any other hospital clinicians yet i've spoken to quite a few a few who do have bar rooms they're using but no one who has a, a formalized i guess sensory modulation room and the effect that that has had on their um other i guess the other management that they need to then use or not use for these kids um, unfortunately as yet, but we'll see. It would be very interesting to know. Yes, yes. And that may well be stuff that needs to come after the substances or the drugs, etc. Yeah. That, that, you know, it's going to be that long before we have the capabilities of building the, those facilities. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't, don't go. Yeah, I, I don't know where our sensory modulation room is at either. Uh, or where, whether there's an absolute decision about where it will be. 
Mm. Um, it keeps changing. Yep. I think if that 